How's it going, everybody? This is Dave Meltzer. We're going to be here for the next two hours talking pro wrestling. We've got Brian Alvarez of Figure Four Weekly here, and uh, we're going to have be joined by Luthez, one of the all-time legends of pro wrestling. And that is a very much overdone word, legends, but uh, Luthez certainly fits that. I was reading an email or an Internet report uh, referring to Chris Daniels, who's, who's a very good wrestler, as a legend. And I was thinking, like, that term is really overdone. <laughs> Brian, how are you today? I'm doing pretty good. Have a good weekend? Oh, yes, it was a great weekend. Was it? It actually was. Now, Saturday night, for those of you who don't follow Brian on the website, Saturday night, what happened? I went completely insane. But, you know, (laughs) the thing was, I got a lot of email from other people that said that they had been going insane for a long time, and they were glad that I finally did and set some ground rules for that feedback because, I mean, this is the way I look at it for the website. I mean, you were ta- we were talking about this over the weekend, and it's like, The Observer has always had such great letters. And we create this website, and I was even having an argument a couple of months ago with someone from IGN, because they were talking about how they always got these stupid letters. And I said, look, it's, it all, it's all in how you talk to the people. You know, if That's you talk to them intelligently, was... you're going to get the intelligent letters. Right, and... like doing an intelligent talk show. Like if we did a really dumb show we would get really dumb callers yeah you know because people react like if we if we did a show and we pretended wrestling was real we would get more callers because we really don't get too many we occasionally get them but you know, you know but, but i think if you talk to people intelligently they respond intelligently that's always been my philosophy and and it works website, with the observer it works with the print observer and i think it's because people have to pay for it yeah right? this website has like ruined that whole, I mean, for, for 16 years I thought that, and this website has totally blown that out of the water and made me feel like everything I thought for all that time is just ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, the whole thing is, I want the website to have a feedback section where anybody can voice their opinion, even if you have a horrible opinion and if you're totally wrong. It's I want not it to be a matter of opinion. Go up there in the... Uh, it's, 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 not, it's not opinion that's the problem. It's just you know the way I mean? the letters are written and everything like that. Right. But yeah, what I'm just yeah. trying to make is I want all the feedback to be able to go up there. I don't want to have to screen feedback. I don't want to have to pick only the best letters. I want you to be able to give your feedback and have it appear on the site if there's even a modicum of intelligence in it or if you've even thought about it, even if what you're thinking is like it makes no sense or whatever. I still want it to go up there. But there has to be some ground rules because some of these emails, I mean, think about it. You are writing to a website. And it is going up on the feedback section. It's not a chat room. It's, uh, you know, it's a website. So if you're going to write something to me or Dave, it doesn't really matter so much for the radio show because it's just going to read it. But if you're going to write something to the website, at least make somewhat of an effort to uh, put some periods in there, maybe a capital letter here or there. And, uh, I was thinking of the sentence. Yeah, everything will be happy. Yeah. I, now, now I, you know, at the same time, if you're going to write... Uh, I think two things. Number one, I think that you really should sign your name. I mean, I don't, I don't care as far as like on this show, because um, you know it, it, it really doesn't matter. Mm. But as far as if you're going to write a letter, like it's a letter to the editor, because I, I would never print a letter in the Observer unless the name is signed. Even if, I mean, where there's occasionally name withheld by request, which is usually people within the industry, and there's political reasons why it's better for their name not to be, and I respect that. But I know who that person is writing the letter. I wouldn't print the letter. Yeah. Now, and I think that the same, it should be the same thing that you really need to sign a name. This is not like, you know, Stone Cold Steve Austin type thing. You know what I mean? Or Which Stone we get Cold plenty of. Yeah. Um, and also, and this is, I, I think before you write. Um, I mean, like, there's, I think the one thing, because you wrote all this Saturday night, I was having a ball. I was going up on the website and getting all, you know, all night long, checking Brian was writing jokes to me all night, pretty much, while we were watching. We were here watching. God, what were we watching? We were watching XFL football. Then we watched Sugar Shane Mosley. Then we watched Rings, Rings till about 2 a.m. And and uh, checking zero every one. couple. Of, what? Zero one, right? And I did zero. I watched zero. It was zero one. Um, a little bit on. God, was it Friday? I I watched uh, like zero one throughout the weekend. I finished up zero one on Sunday, but I didn't really watch zero one because I had my friends over and they really. Um, I mean, they, they we watch some Zero One, but that's not really their thing. Yeah. But they they you know rings rings you know they're like they're kind of like into real sports. So rings you know being that it was a shoot, mm. you know they like they like ring. Actually, the ring show was tremendous. Um, but anyway, I, I digress. On Sunday, I after you wrote that thing, I started getting letters about a variety of subjects. Actually, it was two main subjects. It was the XFL and Phil Mushnick, and, I, and it's like I don't mind. 
letters about anything. Um, the, the you know, and, and again, it's like you know, the XFL. I do not hate the XFL, and I don't even have to waste time defending it. It's like I report on what it is. I do not make up these ratings. These are just what these ratings are. I do not make up the amount of money lost. This is just the amount of money it looks like the thing's going to lose. You know, it's like if you go to a game and you're having fun, that's well and good. Uh, but eventually, you know, this is a television product, and if it doesn't draw competitive television ratings, it's in trouble. Me saying it's in trouble because the ratings are down is not is not like someone who wants to see it go out of business. I do not want to see it go out of business. I don't see anyone go out of business. Okay, so so much for that. On Mushnick, um, again, just if you you can disagree with anything Phil Mushnick writes, as long as you have an idea of what he wrote. I was so sick of having reading letters from people who were disagreeing with something he didn't write, you know? I mean, he didn't write that Vince McMahon caused that shooting in California. He didn't even hint at it. Now, you can say it was a bad column or a good column, and I thought it was actually, my own opinion was, I thought he had two good ideas for columns, and by mixing them together, it weakened both, okay? But, you know, I mean, I'm just going like, you know, that's it, he's gone too far, he blamed Vince McMahon for this, and it's like, he didn't, it's not even hinted, and anyway... That's it for that. I think everyone just has to, I mean, you gotta do at least a modicum of research before you, you write an article. I mean, if well, you, you see a headline somewhere, if you see a headline somewhere that says, Vince McMahon, uh, caused school shootings according to Phil Mushnick, it would help if you actually went and read what Phil Mushnick wrote before writing us the letter, but, um, anyway. Anyway. Okay. So much, so, so much for that. Uh, WCW, um, there's nothing, that I can really report on, other than the Fusion deal is not dead. I don't know how alive it is. I don't know. It may even be a done deal, and they're keeping it quiet, because, I mean, I, I would think that makes no sense, but it's Eric Bischoff, and you just got to think, like, everything's got to be a surprise and a swerve, so. Dusty. It, yeah, it, yeah, Dusty last week, you know, the Dusty last week thing, you know, it's such a minor thing, and I've written so much about it, and it's not, and, and it really is, it's a terribly minor thing, but it's the thinking behind it that worries me. Yeah. Terribly. It's indicative it's of a like, bigger problem. It's, it's exactly. It's indicative of a it's like, bigger It's like Dusty Rhodes coming back to Greenville. If, if I was running this show, and, you know, I'm, you know, we're having trouble selling tickets to these shows. I mean, God knows. And God knows Dusty Rhodes is not the answer to anyone's problems. It's a one-week thing that will put a smile on people's faces or it'll be bad. And it wasn't all that good, but theoretically it should have been, you know, fun nostalgia. Okay. Dusty Rhodes coming back to Greenville. I would advertise like crazy in Greenville. Dusty Rhodes is going to be there. The guy used to be a draw. He can't draw there week after week, but for one time, you know, people will, people will go back. But instead of doing that and making some money, they wanted to keep it a secret. Then, for whatever reason, the secret got out, okay? And then they went in there and they said, it's not going to happen, so that when they can pull him out on that show, it's still a secret. And it's like, okay, so because of the way that angle was set up, and it turns out Dusty was there. We were all surprised. They did a 2.1 quarter, which is horrible. Um, it, I mean, whether the skit was good or bad is immaterial. The point is, is that like they went to all that extent to lie for something that meant nothing and cost them money at the box office. And may probably didn't c cost them too many viewers, but may you know may have cost them if if the word was out. You know, I mean, they got Dusty on right before the the thing turned. But, you know, who knows? Who knows? If the word was out that Dusty for sure wasn't going to be there, which is, in fact, what the word was, maybe some people would have, you know, stuck around if they had known that he actually was going to be there. And, and you know what I mean? Plus, you had the possibility just at the beginning of the show when they're talking about Dusty's going to be there, and then it ends up with uh, Ric Flair coming out in disguise. It's like, you know, right there, people may have turned the channel. Um, Possibly. Because they were told, look, the real Dusty's not going to be here. So Ric Flair is the surprise, Dusty is the angle. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah. what I thought. It was like, you know. Actually, that's what I thought, too. Yeah. So. <laughs> if I were if I were there to see Dusty and Flair came out and I knew Raw was coming on and I didn't have to watch both shows, I'd probably would turn the channel. Yeah. No, there were people who did it, although, you know, whatever. I just uh, look at it as like when you do an angle like that that's supposed to surprise people or whatever, uh, do you make any money off it? If you do, then it was good. If you don't, okay. then what was the point? Okay, there are times, there are times where a surprise is good, when it when it has to do with like you know a bigger thing down the road. But when you have somebody coming back like a Dusty Rose, which is really a one-time pop, you, you why give away the one-time pop without advertising it? 
Yeah. Because that's all you're going to get. I, nostalgia act, there's no, leg, there's no legs in a nostalgia act. I mean, let's, let's get an example would be, say Hunter didn't have an opponent for WrestleMania still, and it was like two weeks out from the show, and then uh, the Raw two weeks before WrestleMania, all of a sudden, it's a total surprise, it fooled everyone, there's Shawn Michaels challenging Hunter to a match. Okay, you did nothing for that show, but you built up a match for a show at WrestleMania that's going to make some money. Right. Yeah, so fine. there's a point to that surprise, because you're making money with it in the end. But there's also another there's also another thing. WWF can get away with things that WCW can't because they are making money and they have full houses. And the fact is is that all of these it's like it's like uh, just as an example tonight, LA is sold out. Okay. Yeah. If Shawn Michaels is coming in or not coming in on tonight's show, and as best of my knowledge, he's not. But that's another story. But if he is coming in on tonight's show, it will not make one difference in tickets sold. Yeah, it's because sold all out. the tickets are sold out. So. When you have, a, it's, there's a different mentality when you have sellout crowds than when you're struggling to drop 2,000 paid. Yeah. You know, the, you can't go by, well, WWF doesn't do it. It's like, yeah, because they have no, ex their seats are already full. They don't have to, they don't have to advertise everything. They can like, you know, they can do it. Their product, the name WWF is so strong that the individuals don't matter. With WCW, I mean, their product is, and the name is so weak that they need to get out basically everything they can and keeping main events a surprise and things like that serve them no purpose. Yeah. I mean, that's part of the problem with uh, WCW is because, I mean, four years ago, business was great, but we could all see that it was going down. But, I mean, to them, they could do no wrong because everything was so hot. So all these things that they did that were mistakes in the long run, it didn't register with them because no matter what they did, things were still hot. It's like, oh, man, we just did a surprise and lost tons of money, but, hey, we're still sold out. Still, buy rates are high. Everything was great. So. Yep. All right, let's see. Here's the poll. Uh, how many, what number of mixed martial arts or pro wrestling pay-per-views per year would you be willing to buy? A, none. B, 1 to 10. C, 11 to 20. D, 21 or more. Or E, as many as I think will be good. And what do we have for the, uh, the poll thing? Here it is. Reg this, isn't it? this surprised me a little bit. Regarding the color commentator spot in WWF, would you rehire Jerry Lawler for both shows and also bring back the cat? 19%. Not bring Jerry Lawler back at all, 10%. Bring him back only for Raw, 4%. Bring him back only for SmackDown, 5%. And offer him his job back, but not bring back the cat, 62%. So actually, the wow. majority think that they're, yeah. The majority think they're handling it the right way. Because that is basically where this, where it is, where it stands right now is that, uh, I think that Lawler could come back, but they're not going to take her back. And right, as of right now, you know, his thing is, is that I'm not coming back without her. You know, that may yeah. change. May not. Uh, let me see what else. I was thinking uh, back, and I think that part of the problem for uh, Stacey Carter was just the whole timing of it all. I mean, look at, like, uh, how stressed Vince has to be with the XFL. Absolutely. Probably just totally snapped. I mean, in any other situation, if you just heard some rumblings like, man, this, this girl took forever to get her match together, to be like, well, okay, we'll work on that. But it's like all this stress and everything, you hear the story and just exploded. Yeah, I think that, that, that someone was, was going to be in a lot of trouble. On that show, and she happened to be, you know. And plus, shockingly, it ended up being uh, Cat and Trish Stratus. <laughs> Two girls, isn't that weird? <laughs> yeah. Well, and Ross. his wife. What about his wife? Well, the whole angle, uh, kissing yeah, Trish right in front of her. Yeah, but that's. I, I still think that's for her to get her revenge at the end. It will be, I'm sure. But yeah, you know, Linda McMahon. You know, they never make Linda McMahon look look bad. Although this didn't make her look good, but you know, she's, get, she's getting her comeback at the end on this one. The other one, Trish Stratus, uh, I don't know about her comeback. Uh, she may be so involved one, in the comeback, but it's not going to be her comeback. She, she may not be involved in the comeback. I wouldn't bet money on her being involved in the comeback. I think Linda McMahon's going to get her comeback on Trish Stratus and Vince McMahon. Hmm. Not Trish Stratus and Linda. It could be. could be. I don't think it's going to be Linda and Trish Stratus getting their comeback on Vince. Anyway. Imagine the acting, though, for that segment. <laughs> oh my God! Uh, let's see. The only thing that I know, do, you, do you have the raw lineup? No, I didn't get anything. Okay, I haven't got it. I know I know Ben Juan Eddie Guerrero is for sure, because there's and there is concern over how to handle that because the idea is that Ben is supposed to be this this over baby face, and they kind of didn't handle it that well on on SmackDown, and now the feeling is is they're going to Los Angeles, and you know Eddie might get cheered in Los Angeles, which actually. There's a little bit too much worrying on that one because the feeling is, is, you know, the Guerrero name in Los Angeles, but that's like from the 70s, 
Yeah. And none of those fans are still around. I mean, Chavo Guerrero, you know, was a huge star in L.A., but I remember, and this is going back like six, seven years, going to independent shows and, and AAA shows when Chavo was there, and we were amazed at how little anyone remembered him. You know, it's yeah. just, you know, it's just so far back that it, it, you know, it doesn't really matter. Do they expect Benoit to have fully turned babyface by now? Or is this um, supposed to be like a, um, just part of it? No, Thursday was supposed to be it, believe it or not. That Last is so, Monday and Thursday of last week. You know, it used to be like if someone was going to turn babyface and someone would do this terribly dastardly thing to him. Now it's like, I mean, remember when Rock was this, this heel and everyone was starting to cheer him, so they turned him babyface. I cannot even remember what they did, but it was like, I just remember watching and going, this is this guy's babyface turn. This is so lame. You know, well, he didn't make a big they, they, save they, for another babyface or anything like that. He was just one day, he's working against the uh, heels, and it was like, this is lame. Well, they've done, that's how they've done a lot of their turns, because their feeling is, is that if the guy's getting the babyface reaction, then we just position him against heels. I mean, I remember, uh, who was it? Was it? I'm trying to remember who the guy was. Hunter. This happened. Remember they were, no, they, not, well, not that was this, no, no, I'm not talking about Hunter. I think it may have been a Shawn Michaels at one point, um, years ago, like going back four or five years, and, and, and I, I may have the guy wrong. For some reason, Shawn Michaels rings a bell because I remember the discussion I had with someone there. And, and, and he was a really good heel, but he was starting to get cheered. It was not Austin. It was before Austin. I remember that because Austin already everyone knew. I think it was Shawn Michaels. Um, it may have been... Shawn Michaels after the WrestleMania where he wrestled Kevin Nash. Remember that one? Yeah, yeah. And he was like a baby face like the very next week when Sid Power bombed him. Yep. And I was going like, you know, your your heel side's weak. You know, Shawn's a great heel. Why are you turning him? And it's like, well, he was getting cheered. And it's like, yeah, because he's a great heel. So there's going to be people cheering him. I mean, if, if, if you only want 100% booze for your heels, yeah, there's some guys like Rick Rude who just have that ability to do that or Tully Blanchard. Xbox. But that doesn't necessarily... Okay, but that doesn't necessarily make them... Uh, what's the word? That doesn't make them main event heels. That just means that they have no redeeming qualities. <laughs> <laughs> Shawn Michaels has one, you know, has has some redeeming qualities in that he's an awesome worker, but he's also a great heel. So why turn him? And it's you know, and it's like ever since then, they did the same thing with Austin. Of course, it was you know, which was smart, and with Rock and all of them is like you know, it's when they start getting the cheers, you know, you've you've got to turn him. I mean, Hunter, you know, they're doing it a different way because Hunter, you know, Hunter can play the crowd, and that's what he likes doing, but. um I mean, in, in, in so at least with Austin, they did the whole thing with Brett, where you know Brett just cowardly walked out of the ring, and Austin didn't give up, and at least there was something to it. Well, that's probably because so much of that was laid out. Not by like Brett. challenging your three teammates, and they want to get at you, and they're held back. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, okay, great. Uh, let's see, XFL uh, based on the uh, metered markets. Saturday night was considered good in that. I don't want to say good. That's probably really unfair. They went up from. Uh, they went up from a 2.6 to a 2.8 the week before, but whatever good that was, last night's game went from a 1.7 the week before down to a 1.4, which means they're probably going to be like an 09 or a 1.0 when that thing comes out tomorrow for UPN, which would be just a hideous number. For, for, but uh, the cheerleader sketch that they spent the whole week building up, um, I don't know. I said about that one the better. It was it was so lame. I was watching that thing. I mean, you know, I, mean, I know what they're not doing, okay? But I'm just thinking, okay, how how are they going to get out of this without, like, pissing everybody off? And then I'm watching this, and I'm going, like, I mean, if, if this this is worse than Russo. It was like, it was like I mean, because I was thinking, I would never see something like this as corny and as stupid as this on WWF. But I'm going, like, but I have seen stuff like this before. Now, where have I seen it? And I'm thinking, Russo. And then I'm thinking, but it's actually worse. I mean, even his stuff was never that corny. So, anyway, the cameraman, if you didn't watch, the cameraman hit himself on the wall, got knocked out. And by the time he recovered, halftime was over, and uh, there was more to it. And Vince McMahon was putting the boots to him for ruining his halftime, and it was just so bad. Uh, okay. Um, Al, why don't you tell him how to, we can order it through the website. Sure. Um, through the if uh, anybody's interested in ordering Luthez's book biography, just uh, go on the EOTA page, click Shopping, and uh, just look for the uh, tab that says Guest Books. Click on that. Scroll about halfway down the page. And uh, you'll see the uh, you'll see Luthez's book. Click on that; it'll take you right to Amazon.com, and you'll be able to purchase the book right from there. Yeah, and there's only a few wrestling books that I would recommend. Um, that one, Foley's Dynamite Kids. Uh, have, are there any others, Brian? China. No, oh, come on. <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, there's there's only a handful, and, and this is yeah. one of them. From from a history standpoint, it's uh, it's pretty good. 
Uh, let's see. I mean, it's, it's, it's the only one, it's basically the closest thing with first-hand, you know, history of pro wrestling from the 30s, 40s, 50s. So if you want to know how the thing evolved from someone who was right in the middle of it as, as the world champion, so it's, I it's everywhere. I it's like the revised edition. It's basically the same edition. I think there's a little, I actually saw the paperback, uh, last week, and there's very little update. It's pretty much the same book that was actually released in, um, I don't know what it was, probably five, six, seven years ago. So, uh, let's see. Okay, I was going to actually finish up on the the uh, thing. My presumption on WCW, and this is just a presumption, is that either on this pay-per-view this coming Sunday or on the Nitro on the 26th, there will be a big angle, and the company will close at that point. Now, after that, there will be, if, if, if there is a sale, if the thing is sold to Fusion, which is not, which if, if that actually has happened or does happen by that time, you know, it, it'll be a shutdown and it'll be relaunched. Uh, with a lot of changes at some point, and probably not that soon. And we're probably going to go, so, you know, a couple of months maybe. A month to several months with no wrestling from WCW. It's going to be a very interesting period in American wrestling with going from way so, with so much product. Like last year, I mean, pay per views every Sunday to this year with so few pay per views. That's one of the reasons why I mentioned that thing. Um, and if there is no sale, um, or, you know, no sale can be completed. Um, Wow. Who would have thought it would happen so quick? I know. It's, it's really shocking. A um, couple other more, other notes. As far as Nitro tonight, uh, Alex Skipper and Kid Romeo against the Young Dragons is the Cruiserweight tournament match, which may be a hell of a match. Uh, Landstorm and Mike Awesome against the Mama Lukes, Shane Helms against Evan Courageous, and Canyon against Disco. Uh, anyway, I don't want to complain we... about seeing Young Dragons and Three Count wrestle. I know they're not wrestling tonight, but they wrestle every couple of weeks, but... I just put up the uh, one year ago in Figure Four on the website this weekend, and I'm reading the Nitro report, and it was like three count beat young or young Dra- or three count beat young dragons, and it was like this thing's been going on for a year now. Yeah, they haven't figured out who program those other guys with. Uh, also, uh, Nippon TV officially announced, I guess it was yesterday, that uh, Pro Wrestling No will start Friday nights uh, in the middle of the night, 30 minute show. Um, so that, that's pretty much. That was the plan, right? Have, it's, it's been the plan for probably six, nine months, yeah, but it was the official announcement starting on April the 6th. The first show will be headlined by Junakiyama and Takao Mori in, in that tournament that they're doing. So, I want to mention that. We'll get to a couple of emails before... Any more news before uh, we get to uh, Luthez? I mean, before we get to the emails and then get to Luthez? I don't think so. Okay, this is from Scott Foy, who goes, I finally got the opportunity earlier this afternoon to see the new Los Luchador show on Fox Kids, and I would like to congratulate Fox for making a wrestling-themed show that's even worse than Learning the Ropes sitcom, which was really bad. I'd rather watch a million Peril Guayo Cien Caras matches than oh, another come episode on of now. Los Luchadores. <laughs> that's bad. You know what? Yeah, I bad. finally, uh, I had not seen Peril Guayo in a long time, and I watched him this past Tuesday, and he was so much worse than I could have ever even imagined. It was... I mean, not only could he absolutely do nothing, he took no bumps, he sold for nobody, his offense looked hideous, and I just thought, I can, I cannot even believe that this is the main event of the next pay-per-view. Oh, and, uh, the, as a main event match, or by the way, that match oh. will, uh, that, that pay-per-view will not air in the United States Because of that Friday. match, I'm sure. <laughs> no, they want, they took no, one look at the lineup and went, this will not air. Yeah, no, tele, uh, not, actually it was Televis in Mexico and the promoters in the United States uh, couldn't come to a, an agreement. I got the whole story in, in this coming week's Observer, but basically uh, there will be no EMLL pay-per-view on March 30th, and as as of right now, I don't think that there will ever be one. I mean, there will never be one from Arena Mexico or Arena Coliseo. If there is going to be a Mexican pay-per-view in the United States, it will likely be a tape-delayed show uh, from Guadalajara or somewhere besides Mexico City, just because of the politics involved. Uh, but it's all explained there. But anyway, so that's been canceled, and um, the undercard part for that show actually probably would have been good, but that main event was going to be was going to be hideous. The whole build-up has just been, I mean, it's just like I'm watching this going like, you know, this is like watching a bunch of Roddy Pipers. <laughs> uh, this is, I noticed MTV re-aired Sunday Night Heat at 11 p.m. Eastern Sunday night. Have they been doing this or is it something new? I don't know, and it's funny because I was flipping through last night, the, the stations, and I actually saw like a few minutes of Sunday Night Heat, um, the very end of the show actually, like the last two minutes. I'm going like, what's it doing on now? So I don't know. Um, let's see. After reading the latest on WCW, I'm more confused than ever. Hey, we all are. we. Yeah, if the deal is going through, will there be a shutdown? Yes, there will. If so, if so, wouldn't it have been easier to decide that earlier instead of flip-flopping all this time? Yes, because no one knows everything and no, nothing's been decided. 
that's why everything flip flopped. I mean, you know, we've had Bischoff on the show several times. The original shutdown uh, was supposed to come. Was it like after the February pay per view? I think it was after last pay per view. Right, but but CBS wouldn't allow them to shut it down because they had a promise to make goods for all these advertisers. Now, what I don't understand is why would they let it shut down in April? Because God knows they still got those advertisers. Plenty to make goods to do. Yeah, exactly. Uh, then again, if they had a clear, well-executed plan, it wouldn't be WCW, would it? Well, you know, it's that's true. That's really true. I shouldn't. I won't even comment on it. It's just true. How would that I, work? Maybe it's because I guess in February Turner still had like full control. And they can make that decision. That's right. If Fusion April, buys it, then you know they can say, "Look, we're going to shut our company down. What are you going to do about it?" Right. Have you heard what kind of gimmick match Hardy's Edge and Christian and Douglas will have at WrestleMania? Hopefully I would they won't kill each other. There will be tables. I've heard tables, li- I've heard tables, ladders, and chairs. There you go. Um, I've heard people say the XFL skit over the weekend was the worst skit in any sport or professional wrestling. Well, the XFL skit was a hundred times better than the skit that ran on a Fox pregame show. At the 1999 NFC Championship game, Jimmy Kimmel, Kimmel, the comedian, after a season-long war of war was Terry Bradshaw, dressed up as Bradshaw and made references to inbreeding and bestiality. Believe me, if you saw it, you would know what I mean. Thank I think God someone wrote us a letter it. about that this weekend saying that uh, the XFL skit wasn't that bad. Look at the other skits that we've seen. Like that was justification. Yeah. Uh, Who is the main event or WCW is teasing to be on Nitro tonight on their website? Um, I, I, you know, I don't know. Uh, but I actually made a phone call down there. Actually, someone else made a phone call down there and gave me the, the answer when I asked that question. And the answer was Kid Cash. But then I've heard that he's in a dark match anyway, so I don't know what's going on. Uh, let's see. Am I the only one starting to get worried about WrestleMania 17? If Ivory and China and, Hunter, and Undertaker are on the card, there are two matches that could be pretty bad. I think Hunter and Undertaker is going to be a good match. Not a great match, but a good match. China and Ivory, is, there's no hope. I shouldn't say no hope, but I think it'll probably be pretty bad. Also, I don't want to see another tables, ladders, and chair match again. I don't really want to either, because I like those guys, and they'll kill themselves, but it'll probably be a good match. I can only hope that Vince learned his lesson with the last two, and that Benoit Guerrero and Regal Jericho will save the show. Um, let's see. On Eric Bischoff's vacation to Hawaii, is there any chance he met with New Japan or any New Japan representatives? Um, Wasn't that the plan? I don't think so because they're in the middle of um, they're in the middle of their tour. No, the plan was Victoria he was going to go to Hawaii want? to meet with them at the end of the tour. Uh, he was there was I mean he may have, but as far as I could tell, I mean the last I'd heard there was no meeting scheduled with Tori Human. There could be. Uh, let's see. I was thinking Ken Shamrock would be a great opponent for Kurt Angle at WrestleMania 17 since Angle is using <laughs> ankle lock submission. It's just not going to happen though. So it's not. It's just not going to happen. It's, it, I mean, Ken Shamrock may come back to WWF in a year. We got him on the show, by the way, Friday. Um, he may come back to the WWF in a year. He may feud with Kurt Angle when he comes back. That's not even the worst idea. It's, but right now, the, you know, nothing. Uh, let's see. In response to your question, if Rock doesn't want a manager and Deborah doesn't want to be Rock's manager, why is he the manager and why is she managing him? How does Vince have the right to assign managers? I think that's where it's going. We all know Vince is an evil boss, and the evil boss makes decisions what he wants. He's trying to mess up Austin's marriage. That I know. I just wish that they had, like, thought this out and made more sense with the angle. Um, let's see. At least uh, explain it on TV where Vince cuts his promo and goes, look, I don't care what you want. I'm in charge. They didn't do anything that like kind of, that. It's just okay, like Rock okay. cuts a promo and goes, well, I couldn't do anything about it. Yeah, but, but shouldn't a manager be someone that the person hires? And yeah, shouldn't a manager... Be, but, um, it could be hired by the uh, guy in charge. Okay, they but, but even clear. then, even then, you know what? You know, what? they could actually do a storyline because I've actually seen promotions where, like, let's say, like, um, the heel manager is managing the top baby face because of, and they they come up with some weird thing, contractual thing that happens, and they're kind of like in bed together, although neither wants to be. Mm-hmm. But they actually would come up with a storyline to make it make sense, as opposed to this one where they didn't even bother with the storyline. Yeah, Vince just said it. Uh, let's see, I keep reading negative comments about Helmsley backstage, Hel- Helmsley's backstage influence. What makes him different from The Rock and Steve Austin? Uh, because he's in Vince's ear all the time, um, and he has far, far more influence. Rock could have tons of influence, but Rock, Rock basically, I, I think, attempts to have a life outside of wrestling. Hunter's life is wrestling. It's not a knock on either guy. That's just the reality. And Austin, I think Austin's concerned about himself, but I don't think that, you know, Hunter's, he, he's better at it. Yeah. Put it that way. He's just he's just with Vince more. Boy, you know, the you learn with the best. Yeah. Why did Missy Hyatt get fired from WCW in 1994? Uh, Bischoff just fired her. 
Uh, why did Paul Heyman get fired from WCW in 93? Uh, that was a lot more complicated. Bill Watts wanted rid of him because what happened was the guy who was in running WCW before Bill Watts was a guy named Kip Fry. And Paul Heyman talked Kip Fry into a contract that was a really great deal. Bill Watts came in, saw that contract, and, you know, Bill Watts, he, if you don't know Bill Watts, you just got to understand, he's from a different era. And Bill Watts came in and looked at whatever that number was, 250,000, 275, I don't remember what the number was. It was in the twos. And Bill Watts is just like, there is no manager alive that is worth this kind of money, and proceeded to do everything in his power to make Paul Heyman quit. And eventually, I think they did have a blow-up, and I think he was fired, and I think Heyman, Heyman ended up suing WCW and got a settlement, which a lot of money, which ended up being spent uh, to keep ECW alive, I guess, in the long run. Uh, let's see. Please tell me this WCW deal is going through. If we are left with nothing but WWF, then count me out as a fan. This is not a knock against the WWF. It's just that for years now, it was the competition, or even the lack of the competition, that made wrestling fun to watch. I may be in the minority in thinking that, but once one of the two is done, then so am I. You may be in the minority of thinking that, but in the long-term ramifications, you're not in the minority in that this business will be so much less interesting if there's only one company. It's just that it's a reality, and it's a reality that I'm not saying it's going to happen. Okay, when I wrote that thing the other day, it, it, it isn't that it's, I don't know what the end result is going to be, but I want everyone to be prepared for the possibility uh, that that could happen because it's, it's a possibility, and if it doesn't happen now, it could easily happen six months to a year from now as well if, if WCW can't make it financially. I mean, WCW has fallen so far, and there's absolutely no competition between the two right now. But even today, like on Monday night, I still kind of have that feeling like, man, the, the two shows are on tonight, you know. Maybe something will happen, even though I kind of know that nothing is going to happen. But I still kind of have that leftover from, like, the war. And it's like Wednesday and Thursday, it's just like a night of the week, and I know I have to watch wrestling that night. And I'm really excited about it because, you know, there's no competition. Maybe it's because I already know what the taping results are, everything like that. But there's there's something about Monday, the fact that there's two shows on, that makes it a little bit more special. And I think that if like when Nitro goes off the air, it's going to be like, well, Monday night, Raw's on. Well, as far as Nitro going off the air, that that one, no matter what happens, I think that that's pretty much definite that that's going to happen within a few weeks. Yeah. You know, it, it may come back on. Uh, probably will come back on on Mondays. Um, See, if Eric Bischoff had not, this is from Chris, who goes, if Eric Bischoff had not put Nitro on on Monday nights, head-to-head -head with Raw, where do you think wrestling would be today? What I will say is is that it would, be, it would be entirely different. It's impossible to speculate, but it would never have gotten anywhere near as popular as it got two years ago. Uh, would you agree with I mean, I don't, I don't think there's any question of that. No, I don't think so. Uh, with the end of ECW, what would you and Brian recommend as the greatest match in the history of ECW? Uh, Ray and Hooventude from Big Ass Extreme Bash in Philadelphia, I think, is the best one that I ever saw. That's the best one I saw live, but I haven't seen a lot of them live. Um, yeah, if I had to pick one, that would be it. Uh, what status of D'Lo Brown, Chaz, and Tiger Ali? Tiger Ali is injured. Tiger Ali's saying. <laughs> D'Lo Brown and Chaz are on He's the roster. He's injured from his, uh, hectic ring schedule. Um, as far as... I uh, was going to say, as far as the other two, they're on the roster, but they have not come up with what to do with them. I think that they are going to try to come up with something, maybe not as a tag, probably not as a tag team anymore. Uh, whatever happened to the other members of Kai and Tai? Okay, that's Men's Tio and Dick Togo. Okay, Dick Togo just started back with Michinoku Pro on Saturday. He had been working for Osaka Pro, and then he'd been off for a while, and then Men's Tio was working for Big Japan Pro Wrestling. Uh, let's see. Where do you see Time and Diamond and Don Marie ending up? Um, where whoever gives him an offer, there he's not, you know. Yeah. Uh, okay. Lots a of source, indies. Okay. It says one source told me Jerry Lawler was spotted speaking with WCW representative outside of the, the Civic Coliseum in Knoxville. Okay. So maybe it's Jerry Lawler. Um. But all, okay. Let me read this too. This, this could be a swerve by WCW to trick us into thinking it's Jerry Lawler, not another wrestler. But they said wrestling personality was spotted in Tennessee. Since Lawler has not been released from his WWF contract, I can't confirm this. Stranger things have happened. Um, anyway, uh, what do we have here? Can you Lawler explain? didn't particularly sound like he was uh, hot to go to WCW in his last uh, website message. It's kind of like, I watched an hour of Nitro, and then I shut off the TV. Yeah. Do you uh, think if you were preparing to be an announcer, you'd want to maybe study the program? 
Well, if he's going to be an announcer, the fact is, is there's, there's no way they're going to introduce him tonight. I don't. Well, maybe they. Will. I shouldn't say no way. Yeah. I would never. I don't want to say no way. I mean, logic would say that they would introduce him when they restart. And, all and if he hasn't been released like, from his contract yet, why are we even arguing about this? He, yeah. Well, he may be released. Let's go to WCW. No. Uh, what are we wasting our time for? You're right. Uh, Scott, can you explain the proposed angle between Dean Douglas and H HBK in 1995? I heard a rumor there was a plan for a ladder match between the two, which would have been awesome. Actually, it wouldn't have been, and that's probably why they never did it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's unfortunate these two could never get together and have a good match. Well, it's because Sean didn't... <laughs> they may not have had a good match, although Sean certainly had good matches with people a lot worse than him. Uh, let's see... Since WCW has had deals with Japanese promotions in the past, would it be possible for WWF to do the same thing with Noah? I mean, it would be. Of course, it would be possible. It will never last. For, for on either side, there's just the mentality difference between the two sides. They could not. Work yeah, I mean, WWF that. would bring a guy in, um, just crush him, and then they would send over uh, Dilo Brown or yeah. somebody they don't use on TV. Which is pretty this much is, what killed uh, New Japan and WCW. This is this is regarding what we talked about at the beginning of the show. Uh, it goes this is from Fred who, Fred Delaney who goes. Thanks for the English lesson. It is only, the website letters are only going to be as good as the effort you put into them. If you don't screen the mail, you're going to get crap. Garbage in, throw it out. The Observer has high quality letters because Dave reads them before publishing them. Stop pissing and moaning. Just drop. Just do the work or drop the feature. In the long run, it's better. It's better. It's time better spent than thinking of funny things to say than screening mail. Is it better? Just think, thinking of funny things to say than screening mail. Actually, the funny things to say is pretty good too, though. It was good therapy this weekend. Yeah, it was really funny. From Simon Allen, who goes after rewatching some OVW, I'm of the belief that Jim Cornette, perhaps Jim Cornette, is better than Jim Ross as a play-by-play -play man. I was also wondering who Kenny Bolin is because I love him as a performer. <laughs> well, you do. <laughs> we'll get him on the show someday. No, he won't. <laughs> he is officially banned from this show, from starting now. It's like the only one. But Think about is. that. Yeah. Um, so I'll... I'll uh, no, I was, I was going to say something that I take back already. Anyway, <laughs> um, he and Jim have great chemistry on, OB, uh, on OBW. What do you think of the Damagers? I think he could be a superstar. I, I think Damagers got a chance. Um, he's got some charisma. He's a pretty good worker for you know for his level of experience again that you know, we're talking about. I mean, there's no there's no Ted DiBiase's there. There couldn't be you know. But damage is good. And, and you know in that promotion, you know for all the talk that like you hear about Shelton Benjamin, Brock Lesnar, people like that. that excuse me. The um, the guys who they really build that company around are Damage, Nick Dinsmore, Rob Conway, and um, who's the other one that they always have on top? Um, a little bit Flash, Damage. You know those are those are the those are the main. Those are the main characters there. The other guys are more underneath guys. Um, actually, as far as Kenny Bolin, Kenny Bolin is Jim Cornette's best friend. They've been best friends since childhood. When Jim Cornette tells the stories about like being 10 years old and and uh, setting up the rabbit ears um, on the top of his friend's uh, roof, it was Kenny Bolin's roof, I believe. And um, they would like, you know, like this was in the days where people didn't make Bolin jump off Kenny Bolin's roof. <laughs> no. Okay. It's a different roof. So anyway, the um, but but um, they used to like you know tune in and see if they could get like St. Louis wrestling and AWA wrestling and all that stuff you know all the different wrestling promotions before the days of videotape I mean because they were like big 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 time wrestling fans. Uh, this is a question from Ryan: Who would win in a women's shoot tournament? Come on! All right, I just got some names here. Let's see if the is names on the list? list. No, of the names on this list. Uh, gosh, let's look at this. I would bet on Luna Vachon, okay? Uh, the names on this list. Is fighting allowed? Names... Or would this be what? under uh, no, traditional no holds bar rules? She'd find a way. Uh, let's see. Uh, where would you rate Greg Valentine as compared to other workers of his time? And this prime that Greg Valentine is a very good worker, I thought. Um, you know, certainly like when he first came in, his first run with Bob Backlund, he's one of the better guys that Backlund faced. Uh, what situation with Mike Tyson in New Japan? Uh, basically, no situation. Uh, would you ever have John Tenta as a guest? Uh, you know, I would actually like to have John Tenta as a guest. Hey, we can get him. Then we should get him. Seriously. I'd like to get John Tenta as a guest. Let's go to Todd. Todd, what's going on? Hi, Dave. Um, how are you doing? I'm doing really good. Um, I had a couple questions for Luthaz, but it doesn't look like he's on now. Um, actually, could I pass them on to you? Um, 
So you could ask him. I, I was wondering. Um, uh, I was wondering if his impressions of Singapore, if he'd ever been there, and I was also wondering um, what is his impressions of uh, what Titsmond and uh, Vincent Mancini would have thought of Vince today, um, if he could pass it when, when he gets on. Um, as far as you, have you read um, Scott Heath's book yet? No, I have not. Yeah, I, I got that um, last week. I've been reading through it. It's it's sort of um, I, just my impressions of it. It's sort of like. Um, an idiot's guide to pro wrestling without as many sort of uh, mistakes it, and, and uh, pieces of misinformation. It's sort of without, a, without uh, being written by an idiot? What? <laughs> without being written by an idiot? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> it, exactly. Um, yeah, I, I really, I, I was just hoping to talk to his dad, so I, um, I don't really have anything for you. Okay, well, if he's on, why don't you just call back? Okay. Okay. Bye. Okay, let's go, let's go to Edward in Texas. Edward, what's up? Yeah, Dave. I, actually, I had some things for Luke Des, but maybe you could oh, just pass man. them along. Okay, you can you can call okay. back too. But if you have any other stuff, you can talk now. Okay, actually, there's a few things that I wanted to ask about the Super J Cup uh, '94, the one where Chris Benoit fought Tusky at the end. Yeah. Was that okay. number six? Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, that's a joke. No, it was the first one, Brian. <laughs> Check it. Okay. Okay. Uh, just a, a few questions from there. I noticed that all the all the finishes were clean, except for uh, uh, Gatos. Um, it's like Dima Linko and the Super Dolphin. It looked like they had kicked out at the three or right at the three. And I was wondering why, why were those so close when everyone else was so decisive? Was that to make him look like a dark horse? I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the politics involved were, were there. So I don't, I don't, I don't it may have been. If there um, was ever a dark horse, it's ghetto. <laughs> so maybe. Yeah, maybe it was one of those things where. They had to have, like, the New Japan. You know, it was a New Japan tournament, uh -huh. and Dean Malenko was a New Japan guy, and maybe it was one of those things where, you know, there was some just politics involved when you have interpromotional matches where the guy would go down, you know, and do and lose the match, but he really wasn't, or the company wasn't, maybe wasn't even the guy willing to let their guy look that bad. It was kind of like, you know, interpromotional stuff is always great on paper, but when you have the, the heads of the two companies running it, there's, oh, it always ends up being screwed up. It's like, I think interpromotional stuff should always be booked by fans. <laughs> I'm just teasing when I say that. <laughs> because, because the companies, their egos get so big that it's, it's never done right. Yeah. Okay, and another question from the Super J Cup is, um, at one point during, before one of the matches, they started to play some country music, and I was really expecting Benoit to come out, but it, we got Ricky Fuji in a Canadian jacket, and I was kind of wanting to know what the story was that was about. Ricky Fuji. I, hard Rock Ricky Fuji, and he came out to country music? With a Canadian jacket on. Maybe they have the wrong okay, well, CD. <laughs> no, Ricky Fuji, the gimmick with Ricky Fuji was, when he first started there, was he had worked a lot in Calgary. So he kind of, and Calgary to the Japanese at that point in time, was kind of this mystical, because of Dynamite Kid and everything, it was oh. Bad News and Davey and all them, was kind of like this mystical place when it comes to wrestling. So for Ricky Fuji to go to be a Calgary guy... You know, it was kind of like, that, that's what that was all about with the Canadian jacket. You know, and plus I think he held some junior heavyweight title for an independent promotion in Calgary, and he brought that to FMW. See, I forget what the initials were now. It's many, many years ago. Okay, and, and the last one is, um, you had mentioned that Sasuke and Liger had botched the ending of their match? Yes. Um, actually, that's kind of disappointing, because I thought that really made the match was that where he messed up and then Liger laughed at him. So when Liger he saved got that. the pin, it was, to me it was more dramatic. Go ahead, Brian. I just think Liger saved that. I remember that. It was like, uh, I think Sasuke was going for a dive or something. He just slipped on the ropes or something. just totally crashed. And Liger just laughed at him, you know. And, and then he went and did the hurt. He went right to the right away. It was awesome. Yeah. But that was a missed spot. Really? Okay. Yeah. And uh, if you could just ask Luke Dez, I just wanted to know um, how many people actually tried to shoot on him in the ring. And, uh, I, I bet you the number is very small. But well, you know what? That reminds me. I'm going to bring up, if we can find him. If not, we won't be able to ask him. But, uh, Brian, if I don't remind we will see the, the Paul Bosch story. Do you know okay. the Paul Bosch story with Luthez, Brian? No. Okay, well, hopefully we got him on and we'll, we'll get the Paul Bosch. It's a great story. I mean, it's a, uh, I mean, I, because I've, I've actually heard it from both sides. And, um, I'll tell the Paul Bosch version of the story because, and Lou will tell the Luthez version. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great story. Is anyway. there a chance that they won't, uh, mash? Yeah, well, we'll find out. <laughs> okay, else then, uh, can I ask just one more thing? Yeah, go for sure, it. Sure, of course. Of course uh, yeah, you guys have been talking about blunders uh, in wrestling the other day, and I just thought of one. I was remembering when um, 
Haku body slammed Big John Studd a few weeks before the big body slam match at WrestleMania, and I was wondering what happened. Really? There. Oops. I didn't even remember that. Yeah, he was King Tonga at the time, and uh, he, he just, you know how everyone would try it, but they could never do it, and he yeah. went to do it, and he did it. And I think the excuse the announcer gave, <laughs> it might have been uh, Gorilla, but they said that, well, he didn't get him the full rotation, <laughs> but he did get the full rotation. <laughs> He gave me a body slam and Luger gave Yokozuna. Yokozuna shouldn't have counted either. <laughs> you know, um, that must have been that moment must have been so funny because you know John Studd obviously, you know he knew he wasn't supposed to go up and he's going like I'm not supposed to go up and and you know and, and that's Haku's a tight note bad, about uh, Haku. Yeah, you know he goes like you know Haku's not a bad guy and then he's going to screw something up. I'm sure it was like a miscommunication, mm -hmm. but um, I guess like you know John Studd like didn't like rake his eyes or anything. <laughs> <laughs> For the good of the, for the good of uh, keeping the Andre thing alive, right? Yeah. Well, it's like I had to do it for business. It's like, sort of like he's up there, and it's like, well, okay, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> do whatever you want with me. Okay. Well, that's pretty much all I had, guys. Thanks a lot. Okay, let's go to Hector. Hector, what's up? Um, I was waiting for Lou too, but I have a few questions for you. Man, um, we're 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 well, no one likes us today. Yeah. I'm just. Uh, one moment. Um, Hector agrees. What is? <laughs> Uh, who's Jericho going to wrestle for WrestleMania? Rumor has it uh, Steve Regal or William Regal, but um, I, I think we'll probably find out in the next two days because I'm of the impression that the card is supposed to be finalized today. Oh, and so, when are you going to so we'll probably be in start the chat seeing room? angles tonight? What? And when, when are you going to be in the chat room? Uh, you said you were going to go one of these days. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Good question. Um, maybe. If you tell me how to do the thing, uh, maybe later this week. Not Monday, not Monday or Tuesday, but maybe another day later this week. Oh, uh, and um, what do you think of an angle like Cat going up to Vince and saying "woof woof," like uh, apologizing for for leaving uh, for for her behavior or something like that? Would it be like a meow? If, if 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 Lawler was to come back, I'll tell you. If they, I would guarantee that she would apologize. If they would take her back, I think the problem is is that they won't take her back. I don't have any question because I'm sure like when the whole thing happened, you know, she probably was apologetic anyway, just going like, or you know, certainly by now it's just like, oh, you know, I mean, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cause a big fuss. I'm sure she, I'm sure she would do that. I don't know that they. I, I think that they, you know, this is the, you know, they're at the stalemate right now. And if it is Lawler, if it really is Lawler who's at the show, which I mean, and he's not going to be on TV tonight, so you know, it's, I mean. We may look stupid, but I don't think so. But if it is, it, it, you know, the whole business of Lawler, um, you know, you know, uh, I don't know. I mean, th just the fact that that's a possibility that tells you that they don't think it's a good chance to uh, go back there. Because if Lawler thought that it was a better than fifty percent chance he was going back, why would he even bother negotiating with WCW unless it's just a public negotiation to raise his price? Then well, I guess Lawler's a smart guy. He could do. That. He might. He might do that as well. Yeah. Well. All right. Thank you. Hey, we are joined by Luthez. One of the real, I don't know, whatever used term, real legend of professional wrestling. Um, Lou, how are you today? I'm very well, thank you. What's uh, what have you been What have you been up to as far as uh, I know you moved to Florida a couple of years back, and uh, how's Florida? Oh, we moved here about a, a year ago, and of course we spent a lot of time down here prior to that. But uh, nevertheless, uh, we, I just thought it was time to hit the sunshine a little bit. And, uh, we like it, we like it very much. And, uh, anyway, uh, uh, I do a couple of seminars a month here. And I don't run wrestling, of course. And, uh, that's about it. And, uh, how sweet it is down here. It's very good. What are your thoughts as, as far as the changes in both pro wrestling and in, and in mixed martial arts to where shoot fighting and shoot wrestling are, you know, you know, we're certainly more known terms today than, say, they were, say, ten years ago. At least well, in the United States. Okay, you got a, two or three questions there. Which one do you want me to answer? Well, so, so are the shoot, the, 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 what are your thoughts on the rise, I guess, the rise of submission wrestling and, and submission fighting, shoot fighting? Well, submission uh, wrestling is fine. There, there's about, if you would really do a little uh, uh, research on it, I think you'd find there's about 45 different modes of wrestling in this world. And it's really crazy. But, uh, uh, the, the the, the, what they're doing now for uh, what they call shoot fighting and various things uh, is very good, and uh, I even teach some of it. And uh, I teach uh, well hooks and so forth and the submission holds. And 
uh, it's doing very well, and uh, it's not related to what they're hearing on the tube, of course, because, as you well know, that's choreographed tumbling. That is not wrestling. And uh, and what they do, they, they're they selling um, uh, not, not wrestling. What they, they call it wrestling, but that isn't what they do. And uh, it's really disappointing to me. But uh, uh, if you do a little exploration, if, you, if you're a wrestling fan, uh, you can see some kind of competitive matches and uh, uh, that are really straightened on the level. And uh, uh, I, I go to see some of them and, and witness them, and uh, I enjoy it a lot, yeah. Do you get a chance to watch a lot of the UFC pay-per-views or tapes? Uh, I, no, I, I don't. I haven't, I, haven't, I haven't witnessed it at all. Mm-hmm. And so far as any of what, what they're doing on the tube today, I don't, I don't watch it at all because what, it's what? just uh, kind of an embarrassment, you know. And... Uh, they do everything but wrestle. What's what's your what's your thoughts as far as from a business standpoint? Well, wait, wait. You, you you've been through you've been through this business seven almost seventy years probably almost yes. seventy years ups and downs peaks and valleys it's always been that way. Why do you think it is? Do you have any explanations for why it is that way? Well, it's entertainment, and it has been for a long, long time. Even back to Pancratium, you know. The, uh, 700 BC. Uh, even there was even some skullduggering and and some uh, uh, betting, and wagering, of course, and and uh, uh, it has that kind of a history. The fight game also, and if the fight game, you know, if you watch it carefully, why well, that's they did the same thing. And uh, anyway, they took, when they get a guy like Cornier, you know, they couldn't fight a lick and make him champion. You know, why? <laughs> And we've done things in wrestling that's probably just as stupid as that, if not worse. Well, David Arquette. The what? <laughs> David Arquette, he's like a, an actor who was the WCW champion last year. Oh, yes. That was... At least Primo Carnero was a big guy. <laughs> he, he, he was a big guy, and he was a circus strong man, you know. And then they brought him in and uh, gave him the title. And uh, I wrestled him in Boston, Mass., for the Cardinal Pushing show up there for our benefit one day. And uh, Jack Dempsey for a referee, and that was really we had a sellout. And uh, so the big guy was not wrestling oriented at all, you know. So uh, we got into a hassle in there, and uh, I moved him into a corner and slapped him around a little bit, and he, he came out and <laughs> he didn't want to wrestle because he didn't know how he got in a, in a fighter's position and <laughs> he wanted to fight, you know. So I told Dempsey in the ring, I said. Jack, this guy can't fight, wrestle, and he can't fight either. What is he trying to do here? <laughs> and he said, yes, I know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I beat him with a Greco-Roman back, but I dropped him on his head, and Jack said, my God, I think you killed him. And he said, no, I think he's good for another one, one or two. He's, he's, he's good for another couple of weeks <laughs> anyway. But, now, uh, when, 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 well, you know, there's a story that actually surfaced a couple of years ago. I mean, you may know of it, and I also want to stuff that, that would relate to you in your day. Because uh, Strangler Lewis, of course, for those of people who don't know, Strangler Lewis was the biggest star in wrestling in the 20s and, and was kind of a mentor to, to Lou. That there was uh, very serious negotiations that never came to fruition for Strangler Lewis to fight Jack Dempsey in a mixed match. And I was also wondering, when you were the champion, was there ever any serious talk of you fighting Rocky Marciano? Was that just stuff that they put in the newspaper? Because I remember seeing the Sports Illustrated thing of what would happen with Luthes against Rocky Marciano. Well, uh, Rocky Marciano... Uh, I think that would have been fine. He, he refereed a couple of my matches. But uh, I had mixed matches, you know. Did you, did you know that? With uh, Joe Walcott, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, Joe Walcott. And yeah. Joe Walcott was a knockout artist. He guy, this guy could actually fight, you know. And he was he was not one of the Carnegie guys. He came up, up through the ranks, and he, he could actually fight. And I um, uh, made a real good account of himself. And he caught me in... In, 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 a, in a double shuffle, and uh, he, he, he hurt me. But uh, when I dropped down him to, to one knee, uh, he came in, and I, I saw his, his leg was right in front of me, and I saw I hooked his ankle and threw my shoulder into his knee and, and took him down. And I, the only reason that I did that, I wasn't even thinking what I was doing. I just I'd done it ten thousand times before, you know. And so it just came to me real quick, and I saw it there and took the opportunity, and you know. And that was the name of the game. And if I hadn't, you know, done my homework and really spent a lot of time in wrestling, real wrestling, 
Why, he, he would have gotten me. But uh, Ray Steele had a mixed match one time in St. Louis with, with uh, a fellow by the name of Kingfish Levinsky, who was also a very dangerous fighter. And I knew I knew uh, uh, King. I knew him. Uh, I met him in California. And but Ray Steele beat him in 32 seconds, and which was really un unbelievable. But when Ray topped him, why he said, "No." Okay, you, you want me to break? Which arm do you want me to break? I got to break one of them. <laughs> he said, well, "I did the left one." I said, "I give up." And Ray said, "Louder, <laughs> louder!" <laughs> and he was he, he was kind of a clown, you know. Ray Steele, he, if you get a laugh out of something, he'd rather do that than cry, which I think is a wonderful way to live. During your heyday, did you ever hear stories about the Gracie family in Brazil? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm, they're, they're competitive, and I did. <clears throat> I uh, I coached with uh, with one of them in uh, Norfolk, Virginia, and uh, I, I enjoyed it a lot. <clears throat> Excuse me, but um, uh, any any time that you well, put a man on the bottom, and he's going to get a scissor on you and 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 try to compete with you on the bottom when he's on the bottom, that was a, a, a real. Uh, I saw the first move when they made that thing, and I was with my, Mike Chapman in, in, uh, in Des Moines. And I said, that's the perfect out card right there for a step over toe hold. I said, it's step over toe hold and, and, and follow with a cross face. And, uh, I did a seminar here and I did that and, uh, with, with one of the Gracie people in, in Norfolk. And he did, he did the scissor thing and all I did is do a step over, which is a very simple thing. And, uh, uh, he had to concede because with, in that position with a cross face, Actually, if you really wanted to put the juice to him, you could you could break his neck. Mm -hmm. well, there's a story that uh, I was going to bring up um, of a match, and you actually wrote about it in your book. Um, when you were uh, down in Texas defending your title against Paul Bosch. You want to tell everyone that story? <clears throat> well, uh, Bosch and myself uh, were wrestling in San Antonio, and uh, the, the Houston office had... And made some uh, suggestions that what I do in wins and losses, I said, just get the guys in there, and I'm going to do my thing, okay? And uh, anyway, uh, they I, I they had a lot of heat on me down in that in that area because I did, didn't didn't uh, cotton to what they wanted me to do, and they weren't too happy with me either. But uh, 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 he he uh, on, on the break. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to remember the match. Yeah. It was in San Antonio, and on the break, I, uh, I, I, I dropped my hands, and, uh, you know, so I off for the break, and he caught the Sunday on me, meaning he tried to knock me out. And he did, he hit me, but he didn't get the job done. And uh, I, I went, dropped down, and I took a nine count, and I took a nine count twice, and then I came up and I went after him, you know. And he, he and, and, and this is a terrible thing, I really felt ashamed for him. And I, that I was a part of something like that. He said, well, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. He said, uh, please, please. He said, don't hurt me, you know. <laughs> I said, well, you son of a bitch. I said, you're trying to knock me out now. You're begging for some mercy. And, and But after that, why, uh, he, he, he talked to me and he said, I, I'm, I'm very sorry. And he said, uh, you know who is responsible for this. He said, I, I do the booking, but he said, they make the matches. Yeah, he I, he actually uh, told me the story, and I want to relate to this, that I guess you had him in a, a move was like a STF or something similar to that? The what? Uh, STF or crossface or something? Whatever move, I don't actually know the move, but you had him in some move, and he recounted the story to me that, that he was actually near the ropes, and like you whispered in his ear, something like, as far as you're concerned, those ropes are a mile away. Oh, well, that's another story, another person. Oh, that's a different one, okay. Yeah. That was uh, one, of, one of the wrestlers down in uh, 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 Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, Paul Jones was the promoter down there. He, he and myself, we went to the match. Anyway, one of the wrestlers, uh, he, he was trying his wings a little bit. So I did. I put a, um, a step over toe hole with a cross face on him. And he, he looked at the ropes and I said, you can look at that thing all night. And I said, you know, he, he, it's just as close as China to you right now. And you're not going to get any closer. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, with that cross face, with a nail to the cross, what it is is uh, uh, actually, um, it's like put him on, um, oh, like uh, the rack, you know? You put him on a rack and you stretch him 
and you know, they used to kill them that way, you know, just stretch and pull their bodies apart. And that is a reasonable facsimile of that. And when you get the neck and, and the, the guy's out of gear and you can't move, you can't do anything, all you can do is punish him. And if you do it correctly, and uh, if he, unless he's got an unusually uh, a well-developed neck, uh, you, you, could, you could kill him. You could break his neck. Did you watch any of the Olympics? The what? Did you watch any of the wrestling in the Olympics, the last Olympics? I saw some of it, yes. Uh -huh. Did you watch uh, Corellan or no? Yes, I watched Corella, and uh, Corellan was uh, his um, uh, uh, manager and uh, coach was was a guest in my home about three months ago. He was over here, and we had we had a wonderful relationship. And uh, I, Corellan was the best amateur wrestler that I'd ever lived, and uh, no one will ever you know, get, even get close to that kind of a record again. And the guy's a super wrestler, uh, and but I asked. Uh, Mike Chapman one time, I want to ask you something, Mike. If the uh, bone-breaking holds and, and uh, the, the things that are not permitted in amateur wrestling were permitted and you could go and put this guy in there with a hooker, what do you think would happen? And Mike said, you'd beat him. I said, well, I'm glad you said that because that's exactly the way I feel. Unless they are oriented in... Uh, well, you, you learn what you're trained to learn. So what? You know, what you're trained for. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. You're trained not to do that and then... And, you, you know, you can't change horses in the middle of the stream. That doesn't work. And if you devote your life to do one certain thing and then say, well, now go, go in another direction, you have to spend another half of your life to do it. But uh, with uh, I wrestled all over the world and with in England and everywhere. And uh, there's some good wrestlers. Damn good wrestlers developed in England. A lot of two or three of them, really, really good. Billy Robinson was one, and uh, Carl Gotch. I mean, they, not, uh, the, 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 and they were really, really good, good wrestlers. But what about, uh, what about Bert Asarati? Asarati, I. <laughs> that's a long, long story. Uh, I, I wish I had, would have. I wish you would have answered my call because I talked to two or three guys that knew him very, very well, and I told them I wanted to talk with him. And because I wanted to wrestle him, and uh, we we could have controlled wrestling him on the entire continent, or in, in fact, in quite a bit of the world. And he wouldn't even answer. And and uh, you, you know what the uh, what the expression "working" is, right? Of okay, course. when guys are working a match, and it's a uh, it's a a, a, a uh, not, not not a competitive match. It, it, it's what they call what we call the use the use of all the work, but. Um, the um, if if the people are oriented in one thing, like we said a little, little bit earlier, it's, it's pretty difficult to get them to do something else. What do you think happened with uh, Corellan in his match with Rulon Gardner? And and who? Gardner Rulon the Olympics. Gardner. Well, do you I think, think Gardner, just caught up Gardner with him, or what right. happened? Gardner wrestled the right kind of a match. He re he re did exactly what he should have done. He he wrestled defensively, and that was Ed Strain Lewis's ploy. Uh, do it defensively, and, that, and that's what um, uh, he did. And, and uh, uh, he he told Carell, and he said, "You're the greatest wrestler in the world." And he said, "I'm very lucky." And he's right. But uh, I think he's a fine young man. Uh, he, he he wrestled his match in a very defensive way, and I, that was the right thing to do. And uh, something came to light of, of course, even prior to their match. <coughs> excuse me, but Carell had a back problem for about three or four months prior to that. <coughs> Excuse me, and uh, you, you couldn't um, you couldn't turn him over, you know. Mm. But he couldn't, uh, he couldn't do the lift anymore. You know what? He couldn't do his move. That's right. Yeah. That's right. But uh, don't, don't uh, you think it was it was kind of sad though, in a sense that this guy, I mean, literally, whatever the re record was, two hundred fifty straight matches or thirteen straight years unbeaten, that it ended on almost. I mean, like like the fingers you know, it, coming apart. That the, that the it ended on almost like what you would call a technicality, as opposed to you know you would want if someone is to end such an amazing win streak, at least, like, you know, do it with an offensive move as opposed to, you know, the way that that match actually, you know, the decisive point in that match took place. Right. Yeah. Well, I agree with you. I, I think it was a really a really damn shame because uh, the guy, he's done a hell of a job all his life. And uh, uh, that's the way it goes. And uh, uh, a amateur wrestling is a wonderful sport. But if, if I were to give you a nitty-gritty of what I think of it, when you get in there with some people and say, okay, 
you guys can go ahead and fight, but you can't hit each other. You know what I'm saying? Well, what mm -hmm. kind of a fight is that? Mm -hmm. And that's what amateur wrestling is. You, see, you, you, you can't punish each other. That's, that's illegal. And uh, I don't know. I, <laughs> I, uh, the people on, on the carnivals, and some of them coached me when I was a youngster, and, and uh, unless they could uh, compete and take care of themselves and uh, protect themselves, and uh, take on anyone why they were in the wrong business. But uh, 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 amateur wrestling is a wonderful sport, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep supporting it because it's the only thing that we have that will perpetuate wrestling because uh, anything else that they're doing is not going to do it. Even the, uh, uh, the all, all our things that they're doing now, the... Uh, what is it with the when they like uh, the ultimate? The ultimate, yeah, the ultimate. Uh, very different, and then each area and each match that you go to, it's a different situation, and they just there are no ironclad rules, and you just everyone does their own thing. So I don't we, know. We, we got uh, a lot of emails here for Lou. This is from Elliot, who says, uh, "If you think you would have had a better chance against Ed Lewis." Had you been in your prime as, as opposed to being so young when you uh, took him on, you know, in your workout? I don't understand the question. Well, what the Ed was saying? Um, I guess if you know when you, he, he was reading your book and talking about when you worked out with Ed Lewis when oh, yeah. um, you, well, were, yeah. well, you were very very young and 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 you, and you kind of like disheartened you because he was so much better than you. Do you think you would have had a you would have been more competitive with him when you were like in your prime? Oh, sure, of course, yeah. I, well, I was in awe of him uh, to the degree that it was actually ridiculous. And uh, uh, I, I wouldn't, it just sounds really strange, but I, even if I could have, I would not have embarrassed him, you know? And yeah. uh, that's just the way it was. <laughs> but uh, anyway, but uh, later we, we talked about it, and uh, he said, well, I understand what you were going through. And he said, uh, I'm sorry that you didn't make a better account of yourself, because he said you probably would have. I said, well, maybe you could have or would have. I said, no. I said, I'm going to bow to you, but I said, you're the only guy that I know of that I'm going to bow to. And that's the way I feel. And I had a lot of competitive matches. And so, you know, sometimes the matches were not competitive when we got there. But after that, <laughs> with the local referees and the local champions and stuff, that pretty soon you know you were wrestling, you were not performing, you know. And that's what happened. And, what uh, did you, how did you like your last trip to Mexico? Uh, Lucha Libre? Yeah. Oh, it's it's all right. It's okay. It's it's fine, and uh, they it's 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 okay. But uh, the the wrestling promoter there, Salvador Luteroth, he had one photograph in his office in, in Mexico City, and it, it was of uh, Ed Stranger Lewis and uh, uh, Ed Ed Lewis and uh, oh the guy from Missouri. Uh, Browning. Browning, Browning. Yeah, okay. yeah. Jim Browning and Esther and Lewis. And they were the two best wrestlers we had in the world at that time. And uh, it's amazing how they, in Mexico, he picked up on it. He knew exactly who they were and what they could do. And uh, it's, it's just amazing that a lot of our people that lived in this country here, who uh, are really supposed to know their wrestling, didn't even have a clue. And uh, this man from Mexico knew exactly what was happening. <laughs> Who were some of the guys that you wrestled that had never trained to be shooters, but you could just tell by looking at the way they moved that they would have been really good at it? Oh, quite a few. Uh, quite a few of the guys. Uh, you know, quite a, quite a few. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's what we call shooters, there's so many things get in, you get involved here because um, uh, it's, it's according to who they're wrestling and uh, or, or what the time limits are and so forth, but um, I'm looking at some photographs right here, like uh, Jack Briscoe and uh, Tim Woods and uh, a couple of Olympians and old Farmer Burns, who I had the privilege of meeting when I was a kid in uh, uh, Omaha. And uh, these people like that, uh, they were so good and so great, they dominated the entire sport and uh, they took charge. And if they didn't like what they were doing, why well, they'd hurt you anyway. <laughs> but uh, uh, it was a wonderful trip with some of these great guys, like Ed Serena Lewis and like Ray Steele and Tragus and uh, uh, just wonderful, wonderful, knowledgeable people. And then they would give you their knowledge, 
and uh, you couldn't pay them if you had the money to pay them. You couldn't you couldn't pay them to do it. They either wanted to do it, they wanted to help you know, help you or perpetuate wrestling and teach you, or they did not want to teach you. And there's no, it's, it's really amazing, and it was kind of. Uh, uh, cherry picking thing, and if they wanted to help you, they would. Otherwise, why uh, you just go down the road and find somebody else to coach you? You know. But uh, they were really great. Some of them were really great people. Um, uh, very generous. On a totally different note, I just want to mention that on Raw tonight, besides the Ben Whitey Guerrero match we talked about earlier, they're also going to be big show against Undertaker for the Hardcore title. Oh I just want, wanted to mention that. Well. I just just gonna bring it up. That's all. Um, <laughs> this is from Felix, who goes. Um, did you have you ever seen any of the Abu Dhabi submission tournaments? You know, no. the submission, just pure submission wrestling without the striking. No, no, I okay, have not. You haven't seen them. No, yeah. I have not. Okay. Well, where, does um, it, where, where does it originate? It's in Abu Dhabi. They have it every. They have it once a year. I think it's coming up in about a month or so. God, I should I should know. I think it's in April, maybe. Um, they they. Um, Al, do you know? When Abu Dhabi is this year? Actually, I believe it is in April. I'll find out and get right back. I think it's April. Where is it, uh, gonna, where is it going to be held? Uh, Abu Dhabi. It's in the Middle East. There's this. There's this. There's this uh, sh is it like a this sheik or king or something? And he brings in like the best fighters or best uh, submission guys, and they pay them very, very well. And they have like tournaments in like every weight class. And I mean, many, many of the top guys go over there, and it's uh, it's, it's kind of like the big submission event. You know, guys come from all over the world. Guys, the uh, Abu Dhabi tournament will be April 11th uh, to the 13th. Oh, that's, okay. that's, that's interesting. The thing with that is, is there's, the there's somewhere. Yeah, yeah. It, the thing with, with the Abu Dhabi is, is there's so many rules as far as points, and what you get is, is like, a lot of guys like Mark Kerr learn how to work the points, and they don't even even go for submissions oh, because I know. they're so much stronger as wrestlers that a lot of the pure submission guys, you know, can't. Match power with them so they can get beat, even though oh. you're not, you know. So it's, it's like a weird thing because because. You know, go ahead. There's some other parallels in amateur wrestling. If you're a good scorekeeper, you might be able to win the match and not be the better wrestler. You know. Well, if you know the rule, know how to work within the rules. That's right. Like that. That's yeah, exactly right. And uh, uh, if whoever handles the thing, if they have an athletic commission that can handle it, and to be sure that it still remains competitive rather than just a game, you know. Well, they, 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 yeah, part of the things there, like I think that uh, that there was even in the Abu Dhabi thing, they give points, they give like a not points but a cash award for the the quickest throw. Uh -huh. I mean the quickest the quickest fall or the quickest submission or something like that, and the most spectacular fall. Uh -huh. And then it turned out that like two guys who were training partners ended up doing the most spectacular fall. I mean, I mean, was, or spectacular throw, and everybody was kind of like, oh, they were they were going for the cash prize. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> makes sense. Yeah. That makes the, sense because. Someone's going to learn to use these rules, you know, and usually uh, uh, use it to their advantage, and that makes sense. Yeah. What were your feelings as far as when 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 the time came for you to drop the title to Bronco Nagurski, being that you know Bronco Nagurski was a great athlete, but not necessarily a great wrestler? Oh, I I would have done anything for Tony Stecker. He was a wonderful man and my very dear friend, and uh, uh, even his brother who was in a sanitarium at the time. <laughs> Uh, we, I even uh, ended up uh, working out with him, and uh, uh, every time Tony would talk with him, Tony said you know, he, would, he would call me sometimes, LD, and just say, uh, "Joe's in the, as you know, he's still in the hospital or in the, in the home." But he said uh, he can rem not remember your name, but he said, "Tell him uh, I said hello to that kid from St. Louis." <laughs> yeah, no. So I'm glad that he, he, at least he remembered working out with me because the guy was so superior. Uh, to uh, everyone that was around, even Ed Lewis told me he said he was the best wrestler in the world. He said he was better than I was, but he said really? that's the reason I didn't mix it with him because if I'd have mixed it with him, he would have hooked me. But he said I had, I was stronger, uh, I had more endurance, and uh, he said I just uh, just wore him out. That's all. But uh, uh, he was. Even if someone would come up with something new and innovative and uh, he uh, had a natural uh, counter for some of these things that some people thought were just unbeatable moves or holes. And uh, uh, he, he could do that, and he, 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 was, he was a gifted wrestler is what I'm trying to say. Now, now as far as Bronco goes, what were your Bron thoughts Bronco as far as I know you wrestled Bronco many, many times. You, you actually, wasn't that one of your worst ring injuries was in the match with Bronco? With yes, when I, well, yeah, I went out of the ring in uh, Houston, Texas. Broke my left kneecap, yeah. yeah. Trying to have a good match, you know. 
trying to be a good performer. <laughs> Instead of that, I ended up with a broken kneecap. Okay, it kept me out of wrestling for nearly a year. Yeah. yeah. But um, what, what, what was your role in, um, I guess in 78, Jerry Jarrett, Nick Goulas promotional split. This guy, uh, Garen Shea, goes, I remember you being with Goulas and then uh, jumping when uh, Goulas, did Goulas stiff you on money, or what was the story behind that? Oh, yeah, well, he tried to strike me on money. That was Goulas' poor ploy, you know, that's why he, he lived that way. And I told him, I, I said, don't play games with me, because I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get you down on a stretch. And uh, they did, so anyway, uh, they, gave, they gave me $5,000. Yeah, just I could have gotten 10 or 20 from them, I'm sure, just to uh, change my allegiance from uh, Goulas to them. But uh, Goulas should have had, if he had his, any sense at all, should have known that I was very unhappy with him. And uh, anyway, uh, uh, it was just a matter of uh, business manipulation. Would you say he was the worst promoter you ever worked for? Well, he was a hungry guy that started in the carnival and uh, never got out from under the tent, you know. <laughs> and he was just uh, he, he was a strange guy. He was, he was very defensive, and um, uh, he had some Mexican wrestlers. He'd, he'd bring them in, and he said, I'd pay them 10 or $20 when he said, I had two or 300 coming. And he said, if you complain to me, he said, I'll... You know, uh, you know, I'll get you deported and get you back to Mexico. And these just uh, terrible things just to dominate people, you know. And I told him, I said, don't do things like that with people. I said, you just, you know, you, you got a bad reputation already and you got to you know, bury yourself. And actually, uh, he, he did. And many people backed off of him. Uh, this is from someone who we're talking about your list of uh, the greatest wrestlers of all time. It's from Grant Zwarich, who actually does our, our wrestling index. Um, he goes, um, he mentions that you list the name Dan Severin, who everyone knows is a, a great act, a great uh, collegiate wrestler, but not necessarily a very charismatic pro wrestler. And he asks, you know, what about Kurt Angle? What about Ric Flair and Harley Race? Ric Flair, uh, he did some wrestling. Harley Race did not wrestle. Uh, he was. And um, who, who else is uh, who, who else Kurt is Angle? Is Kurt Angle. I think Kurt Angle is the sharpest young man we have on the horizon right today. And uh, uh, I, I have a, we have a good relationship. And of course, I'm, I'm very selfish about that. And I, I really admire the guy, and he's done a hell of a job. And uh, I think he's he's about as good as anybody we've got uh, in our world today. And uh, I hope he makes a barrel of money. And he told me, he said, I know that you're not pleased with what I'm doing. And uh, I said, well, yeah, yes, I really uh, said, Kurt, get the money, invest it wisely if you possibly can, and uh, then go ahead and do whatever the rest you want to do with the rest of your life. But but I said, uh, you've got a great future ahead of you. And negotiate tough, I said. said don't, don't be too easy with people because they're going to use you and abuse you. And, uh, you might want to give him that advice again. <laughs> you may want to call him again, exactly. That's what I was going to say that, too. So what? Um, you may want to call him again and tell them that one more time. Yeah. <laughs> what, did, what, what do you think? Can you, I know that you were not, uh, by any means, by any means, friendly with uh, Vince McMahon's father or with Toots Oh, Mark. yes, I was. Oh, yeah, um, you were? Okay. Well, Jess McMahon, his grandfather, uh, was really wired politically and was... And uh, Ed Stranger Lewis and Jess and myself had a great relationship, and we he had all the Pennsylvania towns and cities, and uh, Ed and myself would uh, visit with him and have lunch with him, and we'd ride the train up and, uh, up and back, and uh, we had a good relationship. And I, I, I worked. I have. Uh, who am I to second guess people that are try, trying to make some money and they're, they're doing a hell of a job of making money too, and. Uh, uh, but when uh, his, 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 when Vinny's father was pretty well ruling, ruling the roost, uh, I wrestled two of his uh, so-called champions uh, in uh, Toronto, Canada, and beat both of them right up there. But they never used that publicity in this country. <laughs> That's yeah. crazy, isn't it? And, but uh, what were your thoughts as far as uh, as far as uh, Toots Mont? I mean, I know Toots Mont was, uh, was a great was wrestler. A yeah. Yeah, he he would steal the cream out of your coffee, and uh, he actually he actually he played the ponies all the time, and uh, uh, a bright man shouldn't do that, you know. But 
he, he actually did, did a thing, like a terrible thing. His, his wife was, um, uh, she had a, uh, a ladies' dress shop in St. Louis, very, very sophisticated place. And he stole, actually stole things out of there and, 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 and sold some of that clothing to play the ponies, if you'll believe that. You know, what a, what a horrible thing to do. And but he, I, I had no uh, you know, regard for him at all. Let's get to Tommy in Toronto. Tommy, what's up? Hey, gentlemen, how are you? Hey. Very good. Lou, how are you? Yes, hello, Tommy. Uh, Lou, I wanted to ask you a question. Sure. Uh, seeing that back then there was no big dominant company, you were a heavyweight champion traveling all over the country, dealing with different promoters everywhere you went. I'm surprised. Uh, maybe you have it. Do you have any double cross stories? Any any time where you were the champ, where they told you one thing and maybe they told the other guy a different thing? There's a possibility. Yeah, that happened. Uh, it happened several times in, in foreign uh, foreign shores. Uh, when you go to foreign countries and you're you're wrestling there, and uh, they have their own referees, of course, <laughs> and they their own athletic commission. It's a, it's really a tricky situation. And uh, that's when you really had to be cautious and uh, play it right down the middle and uh, don't put yourself in a compromising position at any time and don't do anything that you could get disqualified for. That's another thing. Like, uh, But nevertheless, uh, uh, I did survive. And uh, Ed Strangler Lewis counsel with me before I left, and he said, just do the best you can, keep your dukes up and watch what you're doing. And he said, um, uh, you'll be okay. <laughs> One last question here. Uh, Lou, who do you think right now, from what you've seen, uh, is is somebody that could probably wear the the heavyweight championship in the 40s? That that's a, a 2001 wrestler that could probably go with the guys that were going back then and and put on the show and and and. Just mentioned one a couple of minutes ago, Kurt Angle. Kurt Angle. Kurt Angle. He's, he's got it all. He has a great personality. And he has it all, and he. Uh, uh, he has. He's so knowledgeable and so comfortable with the with the fact that he knows how to wrestle, that he doesn't have any problems. He doesn't have any uh, 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 any problems of going in and facing the barrier with anyone. And that's great. Thanks very much. You're welcome. Let's go to Ray in New York. Ray, what's up? Hey guys, uh, this is Razor. Uh, everybody in Undernet Wrestling, hello. Um, I had two questions, if that's okay. Uh, first off, I want to know um, what you think will happen if WCW doesn't get sold. I mean, how do you think it will affect everything? WWF hasn't had competition in a while, but do you think it will detriment it even further, or will it be good? Well, that's that's a tough call because uh, WCW uh, they had everything going for them, and, and uh, Turner had the the deep pockets of the handle of everything, but. Uh, I think he made the error of uh, uh, hiring television people rather than wrestling people, someone that had uh, a wrestling background, uh, to run their, their business. But uh, anyway, uh, when you make mistakes like that, you got to pay the price. <laughs> and they did. And uh, I would have uh, enjoyed a lot more competition from both sides. I think it would have been great. But uh, it looks like uh, they dropped the ball. And uh, it's just... A damn shame that they would let a thing like that get away from them. But uh, that's the way it goes. You do your homework or it's not going to work. <laughs> okay. Um, my uh, second question was um, when Shawn Michaels come back, which I'm hoping is tonight, do you think he will be involved in a, uh, a heel or a face program? I myself think he's the best heel ever. But um, who? Shawn, Shawn Michaels. Michaels. Uh, what he's going to do, what they're going to do? Well, I'm just wondering what, what kind of program you think he'd be involved in. Oh my God, that's a, that's a, that's a wild card and a wild guess, man. And there's no, no way of knowing what kind of a nightmare they're going to come up with. <laughs> and, uh, uh, I, I, I just think he was the greatest, the greatest ever, um, as far as a heel went. I was just wondering if you thought, think that WWF is going to try to, Make him do that again, or kind of make him be a you know a face. Oh, I, I don't have any idea. That's, I just don't I, have I, any idea. When, when you I, get into entertainment, uh, starting in Hollywood and going anywhere in the world, or whatever uh, mode you want to get into, 
Uh, you never know what they're going to do. Uh, to get the international attention, uh, they'll do anything. And they do. <laughs> I think uh, I think when he comes back, I think that they'll probably poke him in his face. As far as long term, from there, who knows? Well, I mean, you know, you, you know, they don't, you know, often they don't plan long term anyway. Yeah. Well, what, what, what kind of a wrestling everybody. background did he have? Shawn Michaels, not really. I mean, he's just, you know, not really a, any kind of a wrestling that aspect of wrestling background. But he's a and he's actually he's a tremendous performer though in the ring. Um, he, oh, was he, the, he was the best performer I've ever seen. I mean, oh, really? honestly, as far as you know, modern wrestling goes, there's no one better is, than him. Is, what he does is it any way? Is it related to wrestling in any way? Uh, not classic wrestling. No, it's more performing. I mean, uh, it's more sh tremendous showmanship style wrestling. I see. I see. Sure. Well, that's the way it is today, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, that is what it is today. Completely. Sure. <laughs> of course. Yeah. I mean, the other thing is, uh, that, I mean, there's. The one thing, I mean, there is, there is all forms out there. If you look hard enough, I mean, there's submission wrestling. There's anything goes fighting. There's, you know, rings in Japan. There's, you know, semi shoot stuff like uh, that looks semi realistic that isn't, you know, New Japan pro wrestling style. Yeah. Total entertainment pro wrestling, garbage wrestling. I mean, it's all there. You know, there's a lot of different. You know, like if you don't like one form, there's plenty of forms out there that you can get behind. That's why, like, sometimes when people will go and say there's no good wrestling at all. It makes me mad because it's like, you gotta look you know, around. Dub, yeah, WWF may not be your cup of tea. It may be your cup of tea, but there's something out there. I mean, if you like don't like WWF because it's too much like this, well, find something. You know, find something else. I mean, New Japan's got its style. You don't. You want something that's real? There's real stuff out there now. You know, it's. Good. If, if you look I agree. For it. I agree. Well, yeah. I hope they do a good job. Or maybe, uh, well, I shouldn't be critical. I hope they do a better job than they do sometimes because when they get into the porno stuff, porno stuff, and they. Uh, it just is uh, run, running a circus. Uh, it's not related to wrestling, and uh, uh, they're even getting into uh, uh, killing people now and saying, "Well, it was a wrestling move," you know, and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> it really reflects on wrestling. And, and oh yeah, the, the, the murder thing. That that was uh, a lot of that was a defense attorney. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I. There's, there's so much to that. That's a very strange, that, that, that case is actually a very strange case. I mean, the thing that was really weird about it is you get no truth. You just get people who take sides that, whether they know the truth or not, they're going to take their sides. Oh, sure, yeah. You know, like in any legal proceeding. Right, they want to participate, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they don't know I mean both, both, both sides on, on whether that was related to wrestling or not related to wrestling. Realistically, I, I have a hard time having credibility with either side because I can see they're both just arguing their side. Neither of them are arguing the truth, you know. I mean, it was the, oh sure, what, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay to, guys, okay, to, thanks a lot. Okay, let's go to Brian in Idaho. Brian, what's up? Hi, it's an honor to uh, talk to the incomparable Lou Thiz. Thank you for everything you've done in the business and for paving the way for what it is today. Well, that's very flattering, and thank you so very much. And uh, I appreciate you people using me on this uh, program. And. Uh, uh, I'm just happy to be a, uh, a part of it, and uh, but uh, uh, I hope uh, maybe we'll get back to some kind of a semblance of what we call wrestling, so that, that people can really uh, recognize it as a wrestling match. Definitely, and also thank you for knocking off ten dollars off your book and personally autographing it for me. Oh, no problem. My question to you is this: What are your thoughts on the death of Giant Baba and All Japan Pro Wrestling in January of 1999? And what are your thoughts on the Japanese pro wrestling scene today? I am an old school fan, and I love the matches, love the New Japan style and All Japan style. Well, the Baba thing, of course, with him leaving us, why that kind of negates pretty well what. But uh, he was a good performer. And uh, I don't want to disappoint you, but he was not the best wrestler they had in Japan. Mm -hmm. He was a baseball player. Mm -hmm. And I guess he played a pretty good brand of ball, I have to understand. Before he but, got hurt, he was a good pitcher, yeah. But uh, uh, he, he was a good business person and, and a nice guy. Nice guy. And the, the man that really had the image over there was Ricky Dozen. And, oh, uh, definitely. Yeah. And I had a contest with him, and, and uh, I haven't had too many in my time, but... I had a contest with him in uh, uh, Hawaii, and uh, anyway, it, it, was, it was quite a thing. And on his on his feet, he was very, very competitive. Of course, that's what the sumo's do their thing on their feet. But uh, I finally got him off his feet, got him, got him on the mat, and 
Uh, that, that sounds boastful, but after that he belonged to me, you know, because uh, sumo wrestlers are not mad oriented. Mm-hmm. Sure. And, uh, but uh, anyway, um, I enjoyed the rela- relationship I had with him, and uh, I really got a lot of kicks and uh, and just a, a, lo- a lot of wonderful days that I had in Japan because I still go there a couple times a year. And, um, uh, it's a great place, and they've got some great athletes there, and they have developed two or three good wrestlers. And uh, but uh, uh, it'll, uh, Japan is emulating very much what we're doing over here, and uh, I would like to see hopefully that they're going to they're going to keep it just a little more solid than they're doing here, because now the advertising in here in our country has um, show business, and of course that's what it is. But uh, if they would inject just a little bit, a little more wrestling, I, I would really enjoy that. When you know when when you talk about uh, Japan, and everything. When you go back looking over your career, would you say <clears throat> the stuff with Ricky Dozan is is the highlight, or would you say something else was the highlight? Well, when I was a kid in St. Louis and winning a title, you know, when I was 21 years it's old, I was, I was a big kid, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, Everett Marshall was a good, was a good wrestler, and uh, uh, I really got a, a, lot, a lot of pleasure out of doing that. But Ricky Dozan and myself um, had some problems. But after that, we got to be very good friends, and he was a good businessman, tough but very good. And um, uh, he was very kind to me. Uh, he uh, put me in, 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 in a really wonderful position, not only in Japan but all over the world. He was um, he was a, a very very uh, bright guy. A lot of people thought he was just a uh, a wrestler, but he was—he was a lot more than that. He was—he was a pretty bright guy. What do you thoughts on Gene Labelle? Gene Labelle is—he—he uh, he tells me he said, "You're my hero." I said, "No, you're my hero," <laughs> because Gene really knows what he's doing out there, <clears throat> and <clears throat> Gene and and, and uh, Carl Gotch and uh, myself, Billy Robinson. There aren't too many of us that can go out there and do our thing and uh, keep our head above water. And, uh, but, uh, LaBelle, A number one, and he really knows what he's doing, and, uh, uh, I can't say enough, uh, good things about him. How about Danny Hodge? Danny Hodge, I was with him, uh, a week ago. We were in, uh, 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 at a meeting in... Oh, the Gulf, the Gulf Coast thing? The, the Gold Coast, yeah. The, the, yeah, the, the Gulf, Gulf Coast, Coast reunion. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, Danny was there, and uh, Danny and we were in Japan together, and we we were the two wrestlers they had there, and uh, we really enjoyed working together over there and training together. And uh, uh, he did very well and left him left a very good image with the Japanese people because he, you know, the guy can really go, and we we had a lot of fun doing it. You know. There's a lot of people who would say that Danny Hodge, pound for pound, was the best wrestler. This country, you know, ever had? Would you? I mean, would you rate that, or do you think that's too much? Or well, that's a little heavy, I think. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's a, he's a very, very good, and uh, even as, as an amateur, he was never taken off his feet as an amateur. But uh, when, when we're talking about uh, the best ever, you know, uh, he, he lost a couple of matches. One guy by the name of Smith beat him, and a couple of other guys. And but uh, that's no disgrace. The idea that. that we always congratulate each other. If you know the guy went out there and did his very best, uh, that's the name of the game. And Danny did that many, many times. And uh, he's, he's a very dear friend of mine, and I just hope that he continues to do as well as he's been doing. Do you have any stories about going to Singapore? About, about Singapore? Yeah. Yeah, I, I wrestled with a fellow in Singapore... Oh, damn. Is that King Kong, maybe? Uh, who? King Kong? King Kong. King Kong was, yeah, what a, what a, King Kong was, uh, a legend over there. And, uh, it's just really a strange thing, but, but he, the, the guy was not really a wrestler. He ran out of gas in about 12 minutes, you know. And, uh, but, uh, uh, he had a great image over there and did very well, but, uh, uh, he, he just didn't have the stamina or, or, or the, uh, I don't think he had the facility or the, or the will to want to train 
uh, he he was a big, heavy guy, fat actually, and he uh, wanted to uh, r- rule the roost, and and he did. He got a lot of help and a lot of cooperation over there, and I I never could figure it out. Never, I didn't know where he got his juice, you know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, Brian, Brian, are you familiar with King Kong, Brian? No. King Kong was like he was like Vader, but even bigger, I think. Yeah, bigger than fatter, or just a big man? Bigger and fatter. But, yeah, but, but a it. huge man. Yeah, big guy. Yeah. And who, 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 who uh, well, before we move at this, um, what are your thoughts on Stu Hart as a wrestler? Stu Hart, I wrestled him when he was, we were both 17 years of age when we wrestled in a uh, little town outside of Minneapolis. And, uh, and Stu was a good, uh, a good wrestler. But, uh, so far as the, the training is concerned, uh, he was, um, a good, uh, uh, demonstrator, but, uh, as he is a competitive wrestler, uh, I would say he was, he was very competent. Mm. And that's it. Um, who would you, you know, as far as we, you know, Brian brought this up earlier in the show. Are oh. there any guys that, uh, you wished that you came across that were just like great athletes? In, in pro wrestling and go, you know, I wish I could train this guy for something. Maybe we could, you know, you know, he could really do something if he had the right training, so to speak. Oh, you see some of those when you're going up and down the road. But when I was uh, really in my, in my prime, I was doing one-night stands, and uh, uh, it sounds like I was really a self-centered person when I probably was, but I just didn't have time to devote to anyone else. I just didn't do it. Uh, I'm just saying, is there, is there someone, is there someone who you came across where you just go like, you know, wow, you know, if I, you know, I, this is a guy that, you know, could be trained to be something, but, you know, maybe he doesn't have the training type of thing. Well, I, I would like, you know, we just mentioned a young man a couple of minutes ago, Kurt Angle, and, uh, uh, if, if the promotion world were just a little bit different or I was a little closer to it, and you know, I had kept myself closer to it, uh, I would, uh, uh, I, I'd like to, Participate in, in some of the moves that he makes, and but uh, I think he's doing very well the way he's going. He doesn't, he really doesn't need me, but uh, we all uh, think we know something that someone else doesn't know. And uh, but uh, he's um, he's he's a star in my eyes right now. When you were in uh, when you were in Mexico, what did you think as far as um, some of the guys there, some of the older wrestlers there have a lot of, um, mat technique. You know, they do a lot more, obviously a lot more because they're doing longer matches. They do a lot more mat wrestling. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with different guys, like say Blue Panther or someone, but, um, but like who? I mean, uh, Blue Panther? No. Okay, so his mask guy is very good, you know, good, good mat technique. Um, is there anyone when you were down there, the, the times you, because I remember it wasn't, later in your career you actually were in Mexico quite a bit, weren't you? Oh, yes. Yeah, what was your, you know, I mean, like, were there guys there that you liked uh, wrestling with, or even though the style was more acrobatic style, obviously, than, than, a, than a wrestling style? But, I mean, they had a little bit of both, too. Well, uh-huh. I know I'm not giving you very much help here. Uh, Kenneck, uh, I think, was uh, the best thing that I, I well, Kenneck and myself had uh, two or either three, two or three sellouts, and, uh, he was uh, at the top of the heap at that time. And uh, I saw him about a year ago down in Mexico City, and the guy looks terrific. He still trains all the time. And of all things, we went in there and did some training for about an hour. <laughs> Sounds pretty stupid. I don't know what I was training for. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we, we enjoyed doing it. And, but uh, he, he was a good man. Uh, I liked him a lot. He, he, and... Uh, uh, we wrestled all over. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think of. Uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the spots where. Well, what hell, I can't say. Yeah, I don't speak Spanish, so I don't can't remember, can't remember some of them. But uh, as far as like some of the, do, do there any of the older guys from the you know fifties or something like that that ring a bell with you or the older maybe, guys? Yeah, you know, maybe maybe like uh, Gory Guerrero or Sandro. Oh, Gory Guerrero, I wrestled. Uh, <clears throat> I wrestled Gory there, um, yes, I, I wrestled him there, and it's a funny thing, but, uh, uh, Luteroff, the, uh, uh, Luteroff, uh, Jr., he came to me and said, oh, he said, that was, um, Olympic wrestling, wasn't it? <laughs> I looked at him and I said, have you ever been, uh, have you ever seen the Olympic wrestling matches? 
Oh, I don't know, but he said, that looks like Olympic wrestling. I said, no. He said, I said, that was not Olympic wrestling. I said, <laughs> I said that was the, the United States version of Lucha Libre. I said. <laughs> 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 but uh, anyway, uh, uh, the guys down there, they work very hard, and they have a good image, and they wear, wear that mask, and they have the people, the imagination of the people uh, right under their thumb, and it's amazing to me that they can retain that thing and, and keep going with it. But uh, they do a good job, and I and I got two or three of, uh, old timers down here that I we we have uh, recognition and we we see each other and uh, have a sip of the grape and eat some Mexican food and have a nice time. Lou, I want to thank you very much for joining us. I want to also remind everyone that uh, Brian and I will be back tomorrow. We'll be talking about Raw, Nitro, and the rest of the wrestling scene, and uh, we'll see everybody tomorrow at five.